Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances, Maharaj. All glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to all our Guru Maharajas, all glories at your lotus feet, Maharaj. Whenever you're, Mahar whenever you're ready, Maharaj, you can take over the call. And today, if you could kindly speak a few words from Canto 6, Chapter 12, verse number 12, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Uh, <laughs> Anshakaupatru Vishya Viva Sindhu Veva Chapitanam Pavana Vyo Vaishnava Vyona Mahuna Maha. No, it's not a full screen here. I'm trying to get it full. I'll stop and try to read. I got a partial and still see the background. Okay, that's better, I think. Om Gyan Timitra. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Avidvam evam atmanam manyate nishya ishpa uta srinjati bhutani rasate tani tai swayam. Translation A foolish, sensible person cannot understand the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Although always dependent, he falsely thinks himself the Supreme. If one thinks, according to one's previous feud of activities, one's material body is created by father and mother, and the same body is annihilated by another agent, as another animal is devoured by a tiger, this is not proper understanding. The Supreme Personality of Godhead himself creates and devours the living beings through other <clears throat> living beings. Purport. According to the conclusion of the philosophy known as karma mimamsa, one's karma or previous fruit of activity is the cause of everything and therefore there is no need to work. Those who arrive at this conclusion are foolish. When a father creates a child, he does not do so independently. He is induced to do so by the Supreme Lord as the Lord himself says in Gita 1515, Sarasya Jaham Vardisani Visto Matatsmita Gyanam Apohanam Cha. I'm in everyone's heart, and from me comes remembrance, knowledge, and forgetfulness. Unless one receives dictation from the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who sits within everyone's heart, one cannot be induced to create anything. Therefore, the father and mother are not the creators of the living entity. According to the living entity's karma, food of activities, he is put into the semen of a father who injects the living entity into the womb of the mother. And according to the body of the mother and father, yata yoni yata bijam, the living entity accepts a body and takes birth to suffer and enjoy. And therefore, the Supreme Lord is the original cause of one's birth. Similarly, the Supreme Lord is the cause of being, of one's being killed. No one is independent, everyone is dependent. The true conclusion is that the only independent person is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Omagyan timirandasya gena jena Chaksu Ummilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha 
Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Bhakti Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nirvisesa Sunyavadi Pasyatya De Sitarine Vanshakopa Tarubis Chakripa Sindhupe Vacha Patitanam Bhavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namaho Namaha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vrindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 So Krishna says, Daibhyesha gunamaya mama maya daratnaya mame vaye papadyante maya itam tarantite. Now, there's a prakriti kriyamanani guni karmani sarvasha. Ahankara vi muratma kartaham itimanyate. Um, and Krishna also says, Maya Dakshena Prakriti Suyate Sacharacharam, Etunan Navikonteya Jagapi Parvi Partante. So, the understanding through the scriptures, which is repeated many times, is that the source of all existence is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He is the absolute truth, the Sunam Bonum, and he is the beginning, middle, and end of everything. The scriptures, charyas, and others who are in knowledge confirm this con continuously. But how does he do it? He does it through his energies. And that is, he puts the material energy in place. And a living entity being involved or wrapped in the material energy performs activities. Some of those activities are what we say within the, the uh, elevated consciousness of goodness. And some are in the lower consciousness of passion and ignorance. Uh, a conglomeration or accumulation of these, these activities along with the Consciousness that produced the activities brings about a certain reaction. And when that reaction uh, manifests itself uh, at, at the time of birth, one gets a particular body, karma, di karma daivana trainer. So everything is under the control of the Lord. He puts the energies in place, the living entity acts. At some result, by that karma, they take particular birth in a particular situation. But he is he is the force behind everything. Here, this one philosophy, Karma Mimamsa, says that fruit of activities are the cause of everything. So based on one's fruit of activities, you get a particular result. You don't have to do anything. But the devotee knows, or those who are actually in knowledge, they are aware that by performance activities, one directs one's activity, one directs one's consciousness in a certain uh, way. And in that way, they, they uh, if they direct that consciousness towards the Supreme, they elevate their consciousness and they change the results of their karma. So one has to act for the Supreme, knowing that behind everything is the hand of the Lord to give the results, either directly for the devotees who worship him in devotion, or those who are, or who are more infatuated by the material energy and are trying to make a nice place out of this material world. Um, but in any case, whether direct or indirect or material, spiritual, the hand of the Lord is behind everything. Therefore, and here it says, 
no one can create and no one can destroy. Um, it's more like the elements that create and destroy as we see them within our range of uh, existence are simply instruments for the higher principles. In other words, the living entity, the mother and father comes together and then the, uh, the womb becomes fertilized and the child eventually after nine months comes out of the womb. But that child's taking birth in that particular mother's womb and his, his existence as he manifests himself in the world are all due to his previous karma. But the process of creation is inspired by the Lord himself who has put this process of creation in place knowing known as the three modes of material energy. So everything is working. It's like a, a great machine. And the operator is the Lord or he uses his energies to operate the machine. But even the machine is his, is under his energies also. So the conclusion is nothing is outside of the Lord and nobody does anything. We simply become instruments or we become um, pawns based on our desire. Our desire impels us to act and think in a certain way and get a particular result. So the only thing the living entity has that is unique is his desire. He can desire to uh, worship the Lord or he can desire to try to make some kind of arrangement out of the material energy to be happy here. So that is the only thing. Once we desire, we act or think in a certain way, we first we think and then we act. And everything is after that, at that point, everything is under the control of the Lord's energies. And we have nothing to say at that point based on our desire. So we can choose what we want to do. You can't say, well, I'm going to uh, act under the influence of my desire to enjoy in this material world and therefore I will enjoy. No, because the, uh, the machine is such situated differently. It works under the control of the Lord who gives the results of people's activities according to the net level of the activity and their consciousness that inspired that activity. <laughs> So what I'm trying to emphasize is that for a devotee, it's based on desire. We have to desire Krishna. We have to desire devotion. If we have many desires, then as it says in the Bhagavad Gita, then one's intelligence is many branches. And with intelligence of many branches, and then the results of the activities become a mixture of various types of karma or desire. They, and some of them may have an element of spirituality in there, and other, other, the other aspect is that there is some material desire. So the conclusion is that ultimately one should simply design Krishna. And that will make one happy and elevate one to the perfectionist stage of life where one is, one is, uh, one does not, after the one leaves his body, does not take birth again, attains the spiritual realm, becomes fully and totally happy and is complete with full knowledge, awareness of all knowledge. And so, therefore, when the one you know that the Lord is everything, and everything that happens is simply his arrangement. There's no other choice, actually, to surrender, because 
Everything is him. We either surrender his material energy or to his spiritual energy, or which is him. And ultimately, we can't get away from the Lord, cannot be independent. There's a class of men who have a certain demoniac mentality, and they influence others in the same way. And they, although the Lord is, it becomes obvious, just like when Krishna was here, he lifted Govardhan Hill. He he, uh, he killed so many demons very effortlessly. Effortlessly, uh, he performed he, he performed so many activities that can only be done by the Supreme Lord Himself. Not even superhuman beings could possibly even do lifting a gold, a, a gigantic mountain on the tip of this little pinky. Not possible by anyone. Even if they have mystic power, it's still not possible. <coughs> and so, uh, but still, after hearing about and even witnessing, they still can't recognize the Lord, nor can they recognize that they are dependent on them. And therefore, they, they, they foolishly would try to remain independent and create their own environment, which is just a, a hard, hard struggle, which ends in suffering and defeat. But a devotee, devotee's intelligent. He understands Krishna is everything, and I belong to Krishna. Therefore, if I belong to Krishna, and Krishna is everything, when I connect with Krishna, I'm also connecting with everything because everything is under his control. And that is a fact. The example is given when a rich man has a child, the child may be a prodigal son, daughter, and decide to leave and go out on her own, giving up the, the shelter and the benefits of the father's care. And they will struggle in so many different ways, trying to make it on their own. And someone will say to them, well, you have a very rich father. Why don't you go back there? You can live comfortably. Why are you just wasting your time and struggling like for nothing? So the devotee knows that simply by taking shelter of Krishna, worshiping Krishna, putting aside all other forms of worship and activity, it's not we don't have to perform great austerities we don't have to perform penances we don't have to chant various types of mantras in order to produce some kind of auspicious result all we have to do is surrender to the lord in devotion and she Chaitanya mahaprabhu made it easy <laughs> he made it so easy as Prabhupada said it's so easy you'll even miss it chant the holy names of the lord <clears throat> which are none different than the lord they're on a pure spiritual energy. They awaken one's consciousness to, in devotion, and they elevate one's existence to a platform of freedom from all material miseries. And when you feel happy, you can dance by chanting, and we can eat foodstuffs offered to the Lord and try to understand your relationship to the Lord by reading of various books on philosophy such as Srimad Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita, Nectar Devotion, Sri Upanishads, Nectar of Devotion. All of these books are full of amazing philosophical statements that elevate one's consciousness to the platform of pure knowledge. So Krishna, but why do we waste time trying to make a carve out an existence in this material world, trying to find happiness in material activities, because we don't have faith in the Lord. We don't, we don't really understand his position as being the absolute supreme controller and benefactor of all living entities, as he says in the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, mm -hmm. 
He's everything, and at the same time, he's everyone's best friend. <laughs> because he has everyone's best interest at heart. And therefore, one who knows this simply wants to serve the Lord, associate with those who serve the Lord, and become, shall we say, fully Krishna conscious by, by various activities such as hearing, chanting, reading, serving, worshiping. It becomes a wonderful lifestyle. But we waste time and material energy trying, still trying to eke out some kind of happiness when he's squeezing the, uh, trying to get to the mode of goodness so we can squeeze out a little bit of a drop of juice, <clears throat> which dissipates itself just as soon as it exists. Uh, <clears throat> what will it take for us to wake up <clears throat> And actually understand our position in relationship to the Supreme Lord and stop trying hard to somehow or other become happy in this material world, which is not possible. As it says in the scriptures, even if you want some, if you even if you get what you want, there's, there's no guarantee it will give you happiness. And even if you get what you want and it gives you a little happiness, the time element is always there, which will destroy whatever you achieve. <clears throat> well, why waste time? Because life is short. In Kali Yuga, life is very short. We don't live very long. Compared to the people in previous ages, we live very, very short lives. And because the quality of life is going down in this age, the shortness of life is becoming more and more. People are supposed to live a hundred years in this life. Most people live 75, 80, some maybe a little later more. And that's a normal life. But what we've created a civilization with so many dangers. You can die at any second simply by eating bad food, polluted food, or drinking water that's contaminated. Uh, the atmosphere is full of. <laughs> Uh, uh, opportunities to uh, become overwhelmed with dangerous situations. It's everywhere. Mosquitoes are there. Snakes are there. <laughs> and it's, 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 it's just a, we're surrounded by death at every moment. Fortunately, by Krishna's mercy, we go on. But ultimately, this place is not nice. <laughs> Anyone who says it's a nice place obviously is intoxicated with the with illusion. So why waste time trying to eke out something you can't keep anyway? And whatever. Or better to engage in devotional service and simply worship the Lord with all our energy, heart, mind, intelligence, abilities, and resources. And all of these things, which we have accumulated over time, will become sources of great happiness. A devotee's possessions, although he knows belongs to the Lord, simply become a source of happiness for the devotee because he understands they belong to the Lord. The Lord has given me whatever I need to live in this world by using for his service. Manaso deho gehon, no kitchen more arpilu without the day, nandaki shon. Bhakti Vinodakar makes the point, yeah. You know, my wife, my home, my family, everything, my body, my possessions, my house, it's all yours. <laughs> it belongs to you. I belong to you. Now that's freedom. That's freedom. As long as we try to possess something in this world, we have to it, we get we get controlled by the same thing we possess. Just like people they want to smoke cigarettes. So they're controlled by the habit of smoking, which causes them their health to go down. But they can't give it up because they're controlled by the same thing that they try to enjoy, and it's killing them. <laughs> and that's true with many, with practically everything in this world. Whatever we try to enjoy, it controls us because it doesn't belong to us. It belongs to the person who created it. And he has, a, and he has, he's made a purpose for it, and that purpose is to use it in his service, and that is our good fortune. 
So, um, yeah, so when we understand that, then the only logical thing is to absorb yourself in devotional service 24 hours a day. <laughs> because life is very short. And we, we've even made it shorter by the way we live today. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you, Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances at your lotus feet. All glories uh, to you and your wonderful lesson and very, very simple to understand. Very nectarian class, Maharaj. And you said it so nicely. I mean, we are foolishly trying to connect with everything else but Krishna. But if we connect with Krishna, we have everything else automatically. And then we wish, I wish we could internalize it and actually apply it. Apply it. Um, devotees, feel free to unmute yourself. Please um, go ahead, switch on your cameras. Let Maharaj look at you. Let him bless you. And f feel free to ask questions. Maharaj is right here. Revol. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Dandvat Pranam, Jai Srila Prabhupada. I don't. So, Maharaj, I have one question. Like, we always say that uh, 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 Jiva has a free will and because of which we desire and because of which uh, uh, all the karmas happen. Uh, so, so when is it a right understanding that when a Jiva fully surrendered to Krishna, he kind of give away his free will in Krishna's hand, then now you do whatever you want. Like, I don't have my own will or my own desire. Your desire is my desire. So, so does that mean the full surrender? Uh, well, we understand just like a child. When the child wants to be independent, do things for himself, he has to struggle. And he, he may also give up the protection of the parent. As soon as he takes shelter of the parent, the parent provides everything the child needs. And because he's connected with the parent, he's happy. It's the same way. Mm -hmm. we, we're not losing our independence. We're actually gaining our independence. Because we lose our independence when we try to control the material energy, enjoy the material energy, because it controls us. Mm -hmm. so, but on the spiritual platform, there is complete and free independence. But it's but it's in relationship to our service to Krishna. So we can serve Krishna in thousands of different ways, which are very similar and actually are similar to the same things we do in this. Mm -hmm. you know, we eat, we sing, we dance, we do, we do things in this world, but it's all in relationship to the body and the senses. When we do it in relationship Krishna, mm -hmm. and Krishna's energy elevates us to a platform of happiness and satisfaction. Uh, we're not we're not giving up anything except the, the, the false idea that we are the controllers. Mm -hmm. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Shukhakar Prabhuji, would you like to go ahead with your question? Prabhuji? Yes. Hare Krishna, Chandra Vamsai Maharaj. Please accept my humbleness and lotus feet. All the way to your holiness, all the way to Shukhila Prabhupada. Uh, Gurmaraj, I want to check up, uh, see the, the great devotees, Shri Bhaktino Thakur and all those who write songs, they write that the devotees should not ask anything to God. You just you keep serving, the God will take care. But I am, I know I am fallen. So I am praying that I must go back home, back to God, and I must be able to remember Krishna when dying. I am doing my service, I am doing my seva, I am trying to preach and get people and all. But this desire is that, is it wrong to desire that I have to somehow remember Antakale Chama and I want to go back. I am not telling, I, I can be a worm in anywhere, but I should remember you and go to feel. That I am not able to pray, because I am not confident whether I will be able to do that. If I am with Krishna always, I know I have no problem. So is it the wrong desire to 
desire to go back home in this life? Uh, not, not wrong. In fact, Prabhupada mentions in the first canto, uh, very few people actually want to go back home, back to God. But one who does, and Krishna makes all arrangements to help that person come back to him. And so that is the, that ultimately is the perfection of one's life to qualify oneself to go back home, back to Godhead. In other words, to develop pure, pure devotion. That's not wrong. But then there is a class of Vaishnavas that don't ask for anything. All they want to do is serve. Nadanam nadjanam nasundarim kavitam vajagadisha kamaye. Mamma Janmani, Janmani, Ishwari Bhavita Bhakti, Ohoichuki, Vayi. So that's a little, that's a step up. But still, if one cannot, one, one is not in a lesser position or in a, in a selfish position if you want to go back home, back to them. Because that's Chris, Krishna wants you to come back anyway. <laughs> Well, I feel protected if I go there. Krishna is there. All the great devotees like you and will be there. So I can <laughs> I'll be just in booking. Sorry. Well, let's hope I can get there. I'm not sure the way I'm going. I'm, I'm not. You are a pure sure. devotee. You are a you are a pure devotee, Maharaj. You are the Eternal Purport, which called all over the world. So please, we please keep us all up in your place, Maharaj. So at least. We will also be there with you. We'll just, because I'm sure we'll be able to identify also when we meet Prabhupada in some lecture. He said, Yes, you can identify, but not in, as Prabhupada, something else. So I want to also see Bhakti Sangha people there. Oh, not in Mataji Prabhu and all, but we'll be able to identify. Yes, this our person, Hare Krishna. Yeah, just keep your mind focused on devotional service and. Uh... Perform, chant the holy names of the Lord and serve the Vaishnavas and find happiness and satisfaction in these activities. And you're ultimately coming to the point of pure devotional service. We can enjoy, we don't try to, but we can enjoy the process as we move forward in the process of becoming pure. It's beautiful. This, that's why Bhagavad Gita says, Susukam Kartam Avyayam. This process is very joyful. What makes it not joyful is where we still want material happiness. And that's that's what causes that joy not to be there. <laughs> as long as we still want something in this material world for our own personal satisfaction, we block that natural joy that natural happiness that comes with devotion and service. Tomorrow, the actually, Srila Prabhupada has uh, told that the Bhagavad Gita Krishna told Dukhale Masashwatam. But I read Prabhupada and Masashwati, the man is telling, oh, this is Dukhale and complete Purna Sukha or something like that. So I got confused how Krishna is telling this Dukhale and pure devotee is telling this Dukhale. Can you just tell? Throw some light on that. Uh, well, Krishna is telling us that this place is temporary and miserable, and somebody else is. Uh, what else is someone is saying something else? Whatever Krishna says is correct and absolute. You may try to get a clarification on what he means. But Prabhupada Sanji Sanji has written that if you are totally in devotional service. This sukam purna sukam is written like that. If you are totally in devotion service, selflessly serving, it, it doesn't matter wherever you are, you are in, I'm so happy. But that I'm not able to digest because I'm not in that level. <laughs> well, get to that level, bro. Go for it. <laughs> please bless, bless us, Maharaj. Please, we need your lotus feet. Please, we're begging you, Maharaj. It's available. it's available. Lord Chaitanya has made it so, so merciful, so merciful. He cut away all the difficulties that were there and previously, 
He's given it directly by his mercy. It's Mahaprabhu that's making it so wonderful and so easy. He is the Kandambini. He is the rain cloud of Madhurya. Sweet man. Emotional service is sweet. And it's a, like a, a shower of sweetness coming from Mahaprabhu. To study the life of Mahaprabhu, understand his uh, directions for us in Krishna consciousness become so easy and wonderful. But if we waste time, then we, we lose that time that we could be used to go back home, back to Godhead. Krishna consciousness is now. It's not later, tomorrow, yesterday. No. But when I attend your class, I always feel, oh, Lava Matra Sadhu Sangha Sarve Thijaya. That will never go wrong. And since Sadhu Sangha, when we just attend your class, we meet and sit. We are getting that mercy flowing from you to all of us. That Sarve Siddhi will also definitely pass the exam, final exam at the time of death. It pass. So we need your mercy, we need your blessings, we need your kripa, everything, Maharaj. Please. Chandramali Maharaj, ki jai ho, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Ramoli Maharaj ki jai, definitely. Thank you, Prabhuji, for your questions. We have Anahita Mataji. Would you like to go ahead and ask your question, please? Hi, Krishna. Thank you so much for uh, the class. I'm so happy to finally be back in the live classes. Um, my question has kind of been answered a little bit, but I just wanted to know, how do you keep any maybe advice, guidance on how to keep regular sadhana during difficult times um because obviously we're gonna have difficult times throughout our entire life stages and just wondered as how we can maintain or keep regular sadhana during that time. We don't go to bed late. <laughs> that's definitely one I need to <laughs> that's, that's the problem. The sadhana goes early morning time. Yeah. Take rest nine o'clock, nine thirty, get up 3, 3.30, 4 o'clock. And then you have plenty of time for seven. You can chant, you can chant your rounds, you can read, you can worship. Go to bed 11, 12 o'clock, you get up what? Late, the day's already started. And then you have so many responsibilities that come. And then you have you cut a shortcut your son. Mm. Go to bed. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I've, I've seen people who have transitioned from going to bed late to going to bed early and how much their, their devotional life really blossoms because of that. It seems like a very simple thing, but it's practical. Mm. It really supports, you know, good sound. Those early morning hours are the best time. For hearing and chanting. Mm. And Thank have, you. We don't have to worry about doing so many things. And at that time, we can just focus. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Prabhupada said, and he was talking about devotees. And Prabhupada said, if you go to bed 10, you get up at Four, you go to bed twelve, you get up at four, you go to bed two, you get up at four. <laughs> In other words, you fix your time for getting up. <laughs> Don't let anything else disturb that. And you fix your time for getting up, then you'll think, well, if I go to bed late and I, and I get up at my Next time, I'm going to be tired. Mm -hmm. I'm bed early. That's quite Wait. true. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Raj Prabhu, would you like to go ahead and ask your question, please? Hi, Krishna. Thank you. Uh, 
I feel that uh, everyone around us is looking for pleasure or looking for happiness in various different activities. So, and in the activities, there is, there is an element of pleasure, but it's identifying what is real pleasure and what is not. So in the activity itself, so if someone likes to read, rather than reading newspapers and popular fiction, etc., they could read the Bhagavatam. So pleasure is there in reading, pleasure that is there in singing and dancing, but they need to direct the singing and dancing for Krishna. Pleasure is there in eating and drinking, but they can gain that pleasure from eating and drinking prasadam. So the pleasure is always there, and it's like people are picking the poison berries rather than the nutritious berries. And uh, there is also, I believe, feel that there is demoniac forces that are encouraging everyone to pick the poison berries. Uh, some yeah. people do it because they make money out of it. So modern advertising. <laughs> mm. Here they they tell you how you can be happy, but if you believe it, then you get the poison berry. Yes, all right. Center center your life around the words of Krishna and, and the spiritual teachers, and they give you everything. Bhagavatam contains everything, not just spiritual activities, but those activities that we perform in day-to-day -day life that connects us with Krishna. Well, Bhagavatam is complete. We don't have to go, we don't have to hear, we can just hear from Krishna, Krishna the spiritual master. I mean, if you want to fix your computer, you have to go to the store and get the IT guy to work on it. Don't ask Krishna for that. But these are just, you know, these are called sopavidya. Sopavidya means that knowledge which is ordinary. Uh, but generally, philosophical, spiritual, or even uh, moral information is all given in the Shastras. It's helping us develop a way of life that is aligning ourselves with our actual identity, which is a spiritual being. We have so many books. <laughs> So many le lectures, so many opportunities to learn. It's overwhelming. I mean, if it was like years ago when there was no books and everything was done by word of mouth and you had to make an effort to find that person who could speak and then learn in that way. And now we have everything at our, our disposal. Sounds like we need some marketing that's even clever than the professionals advertising. You're right. <laughs> you can learn from them in terms of how they, like Prabhupada said, you can read a verse, but you can understand it from different angles of vision. You can tell a person to, to not do something, but you, rather than telling them not to do something, you can suggest what they could do. Replacing the activity, which is bringing them down. Oh. Communication is an art. <laughs> and those who know media, they know how to use the media present their ideas and plans in different ways for different types of audiences. We are also doing that also.
Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. The, the quality of a good wife is she's chaste and faithful to her husband. So we want to stay chaste and faithful to Krishna and not become a prostitute by looking other places for happiness. Okay. Thank you so much, Maharaj, for such an insightful answer. Namrata Mataji, would you like to go ahead and ask your question, please? Hare Krishna. Thanks, my humble obeisance. Sorry, Shrishla Prabhupada. My question is when we try to do things ourselves, uh, we are not trying to be humble at that time. So how do we understand that the difference, uh, how do we understand the difference between not doing over endeavor by doing things ourselves and um, when to be humble and approach for the relevant help? Well, the help means to depend on Krishna. Just like if you're giving a class, you'll study, you'll study the books ahead of time. And then you get a little working knowledge of what you're going to say. And then when it's time to give the class, you also pray to, to the Lord and to the spiritual master to, um, you know, give you the mercy you need in order to, to present the knowledge. So that's what it means to depend on the Lord. That's what it means not to be independent or, to, as you say, do things by yourself. We have to act. We have all of our, our, our philosophy based on acting and acting in a very, what we say, regular way. But the devotee knows it's not simply by my activity alone. It's by the mercy of the Lord that things become successful. So that consciousness has to be there. We make the effort, and we also have to use our intelligence in, in making the effort, but still the devotee thinks Krishna is in the background, it all depends on his mercy. So let me pray for his mercy, just like when we chant our japa in the morning. There are many devotees who who spend them sometimes up to a half hour offering prayers before they begin their japa. Prayers about the holy name, prayer to the to to the holy name, to the to the guru, to Lord Chaitanya to guide them, to give them the mercy, to free them from inattention, to help inspire devotion. The prayer is one of the nine processes of bhakti. So if we're trying to perform an activity, we should pray to for the mercy in order to perform that activity. And then while we're performing it, we can also remember the Lord also. If we think everything depends on our ability, then that's what it means that, that to act independently. One who sees me in everything and everything in me, I'm never lost to him, and that person's never lost to me, Krishna. We just don't know how great Krishna is. And therefore we think he's, you know, not around. <laughs> he's always around. <laughs> he's in your heart. He's, he's in the environment. He's everywhere. Through his energy or even directly through his personal presence. So uh, does that mean, Guru Maharaj, that um, uh, when we try uh, ourselves, I mean, when we keep over endeavoring or when we uh, act independently, we still uh, keep doubting about Krishna? Uh, does that mean uh, that? Um, we we're just we're acting in, in either partial or no knowledge, don't we? 
Full knowledge means uh, Sarvasya Jahamadi Sani Vista, as a verse was quoted. I give knowledge, I give remembrance. You want to forget me? I can also help you. I will also help you. Where do the atheists get their philosophy? Krishna. <laughs> they want to be atheists. They want to believe that there's no God. And Krishna says, all right, here's a good philosophy. Try this one. <laughs> and then they come up with the philosophy, there's no God. And they actually think, oh, now I understand. Yes, there's no God. But where do they get that knowledge? From Krishna. Because <laughs> that's what they want. But if you want Krishna, then he'll give you that knowledge and how to approach him. Thank you, Guru That clarifies a lot. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare <laughs> Thank you. It's so nice to hear all those question answers. So basically, Maharaj, it's so... It's not possible to be desireless. I mean, even a, the desire to be desireless is a desire. So the only way I think we can do is to channelize the desire to the right way and desire the right thing. That is Krishna. Desire is life. A stone doesn't have life. Desire, but for a stone is jada, I said. Anything living is based and has desire because desire is life, right? You can change your desire, but you can't eliminate desire. <clears throat> Sometimes we try to forcefully change the desire and try and because intellectually we know what's the right desire. However, at the back of the mind, we know that we have we are not bereft of other desires. And that's where the well, then you have to understand there's a process for getting a desire and there's a process for changing it. It's not going to happen automatically. The, 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 the desire to change is the will, but the, the desire that was there beforehand is situated within the mind and heart. So that's been, that's been developed over a period of time. But that, that's not going to go away simply by desiring it to change. You have to work on it. You have to act according to how you want to that your that change to be made. And at the same time you have to stop following your previous way of doing things. And you have to chant the holy names because the chanting of the holy name, Jato Dark and Margin and that spirit that is the heart, that changes our desires from material to spiritual. Indeed. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Right. Devotees, don't be shy. Go ahead and ask your question. I'm so much looking forward to meeting with you next Saturday here. Just to announce, they are opening a new temple here in, in Naperville. And there are going to be so many Maharajas coming over. And Chandramali Maharaj, I'm so much looking forward to meet with you here in, on Where's Saturday. Naperville? Where's Naperville now? Yeah, it's in Naperville. It's like, it's, oh, it's a Greater Chicago, Illinois. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for asking that question. <laughs> Vishy Prabhu, uh, Vish Prabhu, I, he, he, you have a question? Please go ahead. Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you for spending this morning with us. Um, Maharaj, um, all glory to Srila Prabhupada. I have a question that I always wanted to um, get a clarification on. I mean, this forum is nice that it's going in sequence. 
but for someone who is not like um they had read the bug with them because usually the speakers usually they're already you know well elevated already and they give them different canto but the listener that might not be at that canto how should one approach that as though as a listener how should we should we because it's always stated that we should go in sequence from beginning to end so i was just trying to get the sense as how to approach that as a listener well Thank yeah you. you're talking about reading the scriptures in particular in bhagavatam is that the question yes maharaj yeah well it says to progress from the from the very beginning, verse by verse, because uh, the first nine cantos, they deal with many different subjects and they prepare one's consciousness for the 10th canto, which is Krishna and Vrindavan, which is the actual personality of God in the spiritual world. <laughs> so we will misunderstand his higher knowledge unless we have preliminary so the preliminary knowledge comes in different categories, such as how the creation unfolded. And then, of course, from that creation, there is a, another creation. There's two creations. You know, Krishna creating all the ingredients and Brahma creating, using all the ingredients in order to make the material forms in this world. So all of that is very, it's interesting, it's foundational, it's transcendental, but it is also sets the stage for us to understand higher knowledge. Because we have to understand that that same boy in Vrindavan, <laughs> who plays with cow, cows and teases girls, is the person who actually is the source of all existence. <laughs> so... Uh, you know, it might be misunderstood. That's why some people, they, they uh, presumptuous run to the, the, these later parts just to say, well, this is the best part. But they can't understand it because they don't have the foundation or the preliminary understanding where they can uh, read it and connect it to the same person who is the, the source of all existence. So, and it's interesting. You know, and there's many other subject matters in the uh, Bhagavatam. There are nine, there are 10 subject matters altogether. So, it's just like if you're trying to go to they go to university. Before you get to university, you have to go to grammar school. You have to go to high school. You have to qualify in different through different stages. So we have to proceed very systematically when we read the scriptures. Of course, no one is going to force that, but it is actually the most uh, complete way to get the knowledge. Thank you, Maharaj, for answering that. Um, Maharaj, but my, my question, I think I was trying to get an understanding. because uh, Yes, reading it, we should do it systematically. But as a listener, because we go to classes and there are different speakers that present different canto, different lecture. As a listener who hasn't read yet, how should we sort of relish those pastimes, so to speak? Because we haven't get to that level yet where we went through the process of reading up yeah so you just just hear here and as you're hearing you should be thinking you know what does this mean so you can ask questions based on what you hear. if you don't understand questions are there for, for clarification for for the facility for application which comes by uh 
I'm not hearing. We have to learn how we have to understand what it is. We have to be able to use it at the same time. So the whole process is hearing. Sukadeva Goswami spoke Bhagavad Gita to Maharaj Pariksha, and Maharaj Pariksha heard for seven full days and became fully enlightened. So even if it's not systematic given, right, different speakers speak at different times and different topics, different Bhagavatam classes, Gita, other Chaitanya Chari, Dharmita, that doesn't matter. You can, the hearing process remains the foundation by which you can understand everything. Thank you, Maharaj, for that uh, really helps. And we're looking forward to see you this weekend here in Cincinnati after a long time. So we'll yeah. have your association. Thank you. We weren't supposed to tell anyone. <laughs> Okay, this is out. <laughs> yeah, um, let's see. Himi Mataji, you have a question for Maharaj? Yeah, Dharmat Pranam Maharaj, Shila Prabhupada Kijay. I just have a curious question like, do the Mayavadis read Srimad Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita? Yeah. So they give it. They give their their full, their wrong interpretations or understandings. They also chant mantras too. They also worship the deity. But their understanding of the process and the goal is completely opposite. They think by performing these activities, you get to the impersonalist, un unmanifested aspect. And then uh, once you get that and you realize you're not different from that, and therefore you become back, you're back to your position as being the supreme. So they worship in order to become God. Nobody can become God because God is already God. He, that position is already taken. <laughs> it's, nobody's, it's not an electoral process, you know. You have, God is God. <laughs> And so, but the, because the living entity is a pure spirit soul, has the same qualities of God, at least in, in, in most cases, and they mistakenly, and of course, they, they also interpret the scriptures, just like they say, there's a word called nirguna. Nirguna means qualities, and nir means without. So they say that they... That the that the, the absolute truth is without qualities, but that's not true. The word near guna requires some uh, some explanation. Near means without, and guna means material qualities. Absolute truth is without material form. So they know how to take the scriptures and reinterpret it in different ways in order to fulfill their. They have a they have a desired goal. I want to be the supreme. I am the supreme, but I have to realize that through the process of, of austerities, penances, worship, and various enchanting various mantras. We all, we're not, we're not, devotees are not thinking like that. The third devotee is thinking how to please the Lord, not the, how to become the Lord. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you. Thank you. It's a very important understanding because you know, my body is in the very strong, both in the spiritual aspect and in its reflective aspect. What is this reflective act? Those who worship the material energy also are my bodies or impersonals. Instead of worshiping God, they worship his energy. That's another form of impersonal. Thank you for such a nice explanation, Maharaj. Thank you. Um, Shilpesh Prabhuji, please go ahead. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. What happens to Maya bodies after they leave their body? Where do they go? Well, 
They may aruna krishna padam padam adantiyada. They may also climb up to the brahman of poems, but padantiyada they fall down again back into the material world and take up material activities. So they get some temporary elevation to to the level of of liberation, but that type of liberation is called sahuja mukti, which means merging into the bodily proposals of the Lord. It's just a it's a temporary sleep state for one who's free from all of one's material suffering. But it's temporary. They fall back down again. Why? Because they don't worship the Lord. Only bhakti can stabilize a person's attainment. Because bhakti is the nature of the soul. And not cultivation of knowledge, not performing austerities, not giving in charity, not chanting mantras, and not uh, performing penances, not doing good works. These are not these are not the living entity's nature. The living entity's nature is the love and service of free will. These other things may be helpful if they're used in devotional service, but the Maya bodies don't. They, they use it for themselves, and therefore it's material. Maya bodies are envious of the Lord. They want to become the Lord, but they can't. And I'm guessing when they think they are the Lord, it becomes very dangerous. And especially for their devoted people around them. I've met many Maya bodies and had interaction with them. They're very proud and very arrogant. Just like there is an example of when the uh, Gopal Bhatta Goswami. No, I'm sorry, Gopal uh, Raghunath Bhatta Goswami. And he was traveling from Varanasri to go to Jagannath Puri to see Lord Chaitanya. And on his way, he stopped at this one place and he met this very nice devotee, nice person, who was always chanting the name of Ram. He was constantly chanting Ram's name. And he got attracted to Raghunath Bhatta and asked him if he could serve him in his travels. Raghunath Bhatta was really impressed by this person. He was always chanting the name of Ram. So they traveled together. When they reached Jagannath, Jagannath Puri, both of them were able to meet at the same time with Lord Chaitanya. Lord Chaitanya welcomed Raghunath Bhatta in so many nice ways, but he didn't even look at this other person. And the other person was thinking, oh, he's not even looking at me. He doesn't even acknowledge my existence. The Lord paid him no attention at all. And then he said, then the Lord at one point turned to him and said, give up this idea of becoming Ram. So he was chanting the names of Ram to become Ram. You can't tell, you know, they sometimes look like devotees, but their goal is different. The goal is to be the, be the Lord instead of serve the Lord. Thank you, Maharaj, for helpful. Yeah, they're all around. Just be careful. <laughs> and they, they look like Vaishnavas. Even some of our devotees in the Krishna conscious movement have tendency to pick up some of the Mayavadi qualities or characteristics. And be careful who you associate with and who you hear from. <laughs> Yeah, 
very true, Maharaj. They also believe that when um, Krishna or Lord Ram, when they incarnate, they are under the influence of Maya. Yeah, they say they are not Maya. Yeah. They say the Lord takes on a material body. But the Lord's body is always spiritual, although it looks like material. And it may also seem like it by the way it acts, but it's not. Why would the Lord take on a material body? <laughs> Even the question, that begs the question. Why would he take on a material body when he's the source of the material energy? If he enters into the material energy, just like you know, when the governor goes into the prison to see what the prison is like, he doesn't become a prisoner just because he's in the he's in the jailhouse or because he's doing work in the world. He's, he remains in his position. Krishna always remains in his position wherever he is. Thank you. Thank you, Maharaj. Any any further questions? Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to you, Maharaj. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Very, very beautiful class and very nice question answers, Maharaj. Can't wait to have you here in Charlotte. <laughs> Feel so fortunate to be with you, Maharaj. Thank you so much for your association. We are very fortunate. You are so merciful. You know, you you are so busy, but still you give some time to us. Thank you. Are you there's a lot of nice devotees in Charlotte. <laughs> Thank you. We always need your association, Maharaj. Yeah. We'll be there in about a month. Yeah. That's the plan. Krishna can always change things. <laughs> okay, Nina, maybe we should uh, conclude here. Yes. Sure.